We are celebrating tonight the critical roles each of the Davis family members played in supporting each other in their pursuit of a college education and in the unlocking of their profound talents. Certainly, TRIO Upward Bound and TRIO Student Support Services, which was called PEP at Rhode Island College, made important contributions to their individual trajectories. But tonight, we also focus on the critical role your mother and each sister played in providing essential nurturing and support as you pursued your degrees and your dreams. In a few minutes, we'll review the powerful contributions each of these individuals is making to society. Contributions that might well have been lost if they hadn't gone to college and hadn't been successful there. But before doing so, let's remember that for the Davis sisters, preparing for college and graduating was not an easy road. Both in high school and in college, they met faculty and peers who dismissed their talents, who dismissed their potential. They were often faced with campuses that were hostile to low-income students, minority students, and students with disabilities. When Diane transferred, Rhode Island College was generous and Student Support Services was able to direct students there to necessary resources. But when Diane transferred from Rhode Island College, she was faced with a situation with very limited resources, except those the family was able to, to, to provide. Tonight, let's remember that even though we're many decades later, there are still hundreds of thousands of students from similar backgrounds that are still facing campuses where individual faculty and their student colleagues question whether they should be there, are often hostile to their presence, are not supportive of their success. Let's remember all the students who, who don't know that they're gonna have food the next day because we're not providing the kind of resources that we ought to be to low-income, first-generation students, minority students, and students with disabilities. Let's commit to fighting to increase that support, both, both human and financial. Diane Davis Wright, please come forward. <laughs> Diane, the oldest Davis sister, joined Upward Bound and encouraged her three younger sisters to follow in her footsteps. Like her mother, she is a nurturer, taking responsibility for her siblings. Tonight when we were talking, they called her the coach. <laughs> After attending Rhode Island College, she transferred to Howard, where she immediately got a job with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and she continues to work there in the Civil Rights Division. Diane's division is, is not only responsible for fulfilling the reconstruction promise that African Americans and other individuals from minority groups will be fair, fairly, fairly treated in their right to own land and the right to farm their own land, but also that in the food stamp program that no low-income American should, can, should go hungry. So, Davis 
Davis, please come forward. Mild and dispassionate are not adjectives that any would apply, anyone would apply to any member of the Davis family. They are fighters, their energy sufficient to light up any space. Anita is the personification of that intensity. It is obvious in the determination she brings today to completing her degree at Rhode Island Community College after uh, several decades of not being enrolled in school and despite her disability. She is studying. <laughs> counseling and, and social work. <laughs> Diane has had a struggle to overcome a number of obstacles to her current success. And she is committed to assisting other individuals facing similar issues. Would Dolores Davis Grant please come forward? officials here to honor a teacher. So I'd like the elected officials that are here to honor Dolores to please stand. When that happens, you know that teacher is exceptional. On the other hand, when you talk to Dolores for about a minute and a half, you know she's, she's exceptional. You recognize her commitment. You recognize her charisma. You recognize her knowledge, her breadth of her knowledge. And today we have with us some of the teachers from the Upward Bound program that taught these four sisters, so I'd ask them to stand as well. <laughs> Viola just told me that um, Dolores decided, Dolores went to college thinking she was going to be an archaeologist. teacher stems in part from having a teacher who was not humane. And it has made her an exceptional teacher. And Dolores, as you work every day to inspire your own students, you inspire all of us in TRIO. And we're pleased to have you come here. Viola Davis, please come forward. You can come too. <laughs> Two years ago, after Fences was released, The COE staff went together to see the film. COE has a very diverse staff, diverse in terms of race and ethnicity, in terms of age, 
in terms of gender. When we left the theater, we stood there in the lobby for about two hours talking about it. Then we went to a restaurant and talked for about another three hours, I think. <laughs> we talked about our own parents and how they were the same and how they were different than the individuals that Viola and Denzel played. We talked about what had really happened between the last scene and the scene that preceded it. It was, some, it was certainly one of the most intimate conversations that has ever taken place on our staff. Thank you for giving us that through your work in film, through your work on TV, through your work as a writer. Thank you for giving us access to the that possibility of intimacy and the possibility of seeing into and understanding what we don't usually see, what we don't usually have access to. Of course, she also gives us access to a few less intimate moments. I think um, the hours spent in the break room talking about the plot lines of how to get away with murder. <laughs> May Alice Davis please come forward. teachers and public servants and artists. These are your fruit. For being a source of strength and inspiration to them and to us, we sincerely thank you.
We are honored this. <laughs> we are honored that several members of the Davis family have agreed to share some thoughts with us. Diane is going to join us first. from the cotton fields of St. Matthew, South Carolina, to the small one square mile city of Central Falls, Rhode Island. I thought I was rich, you hear me? To see inside toilet with running water, inside kitchen, Swimming pools, beaches. I didn't take a lot of things serious back then. I played all the time. And then I stayed back in the first grade. My grandmother told me, you know, you broke your mother's heart. I never wanted to do anything to break my mom on my dad's heart. So I made a commitment then. First grade, can you believe this? First grade, I made a commitment that I would never, ever stay back. I would never, ever let anyone hold me back from getting what I need. At that moment, I became serious about education. Someone told my mom some years ago that none of her girls would be taken seriously. They would never finish high school. They would probably get pregnant by the age of 15 and end up on public assistance. Now, when I heard that, I made another commitment. I'm not going to let that happen. I'm not going to let what anyone says bad about me or my family come true. I love proving people wrong. <laughs> I did everything I could to just put more knowledge, more knowledge in my head. And I thought, well, you know what? Um, I guess so much is coming up in. Let me teach my siblings. So we played school. Everything I learned at school, I brought it home for my sisters. I was the only one who could be the teacher or the principal. <laughs> I got close to graduating from high school, and I thought, oh, God, what am I going to do? You know, we don't have any money. We're barely getting by right now. So I went to talk to my guidance counselor, Leo LeClaire, never forget him. And I will never forget you, Joe Costa. <laughs> they introduced me to the Upward Bound program, the PEP program, and I'm not sure if this other program is part of this. It's called the um, Experience Based Career Education Program, where every week on a Wednesday, if you wanted to be a lawyer, you work with a lawyer for the whole day. I wanted to do something where I could make money, of course. <laughs> so I like working with numbers. I just love working with numbers, and I love working with people. And I stuck to that. <coughs> Went two years to Rhode Island College, transferred to Howard University, I did not get any help. I thought it would have been better there because I went to a historically black college. But I didn't get any help. And then the US Department of Agriculture asked me if I was interested in an intern program. Of course, I took it because it's all about money. I wanted to help my family. <laughs> I want to say the rest is history. I've been with the U.S. Department of Agriculture since November 
1982. Yeah, I work in the office of the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights. In my office, the office that I'm the team lead for, we hold the money belt. We got the money. <laughs> we process all EEO complaints. And that's all complaints filed by every employee of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We've got 150,000 plus employees. Yeah, and believe it or not, about 80% of them has filed a complaint. <laughs> program complaints, and this is so amazing to me, because when I found out that Food and Nutrition Consumer Service had food stamps and WIC program and school lunch program, I thought that's what I went without growing up. Maybe I can do something to help. And so I do, but I help with the complaints that comes in with the program. <laughs> but it's still good. But I'm still doing everything I want to do. Think about it, food, agriculture. And that's something I didn't have a lot of growing up. So I'm doing my, I got the dream job, working with food, working with people, and I'm making the money. <laughs> I want to thank the Council for Opportunity and Education, the Upward Bound Program. I want to thank all of you, because you're an encouragement also, your stories. And, and everything that you've gone through has been an encouragement to me, my family, and believe it or not, there's a lot of other people who need to hear your stories. Because they think they're the only ones going through it. But when they hear yours, they know, you know what? There's a possibility. I can get there. God bless you all. to tell and that I'm going to be done. One of the things I always wanted to do in my life, and I didn't think about it for a long time until tonight, I wanted to be an archaeologist almost all of my life. That's all I wanted because I wanted to travel. When I was in Upward Bound, I met so many people from around the world. Cambodia, Laos, China, from South America, and I loved hearing their stories. And that's what I'm going to speak to right now. Those stories inspired me to travel to probably more than 80 countries. <laughs> at least I stopped counting at 80. <laughs> and when I was in Upper Bound, my last year, my best friend from Central Falls High School, Juan David Tamayo, he said to me, Dolores, I want to teach you the game of chess. And I was like, oh, I don't want to learn how to play chess. He said, please, we need one more, one more person to complete the team. And I said, okay. So he taught me the game of chess. Little did I know how far that game would take me. When I was in Egypt with my husband, Peter, one day we were in the city of Alexandria and we toured the city and on the way back, we passed through an area, a beach area, and in that beach area there was a man. 
and he was playing chess with people. And I looked at my husband and I said, I'm gonna go see if he'll play chess with me. So I went and he said, do you wanna play chess? I said, yes. So I began to play the game of chess with a stranger and I beat him. <laughs> And I was pretty proud, you know, I beat him. And then he was not very happy with me. <laughs> and he said, we need to play again. And I, I really needed to leave. So I said, okay, we have to play, but we need to play quickly. And we played again, and I beat him again. <laughs> and again, he was not happy. So he called over his friend to play me. And I said, I don't have time to play. He said, no, you must play. <laughs> so I played his friend and I beat him too. <laughs> and then I played the next person and I beat him too. <laughs> and they all lined up for me to play them and they played three to four against me and I beat them every single game. <laughs> and at one point, in the back of my head, I was thinking, should I just not win and walk away? And then I thought of something that Juan Tamayo had said to me. He said, when you finish your game, you always shake their hand and you say thank you. And I thanked every single one of them for the game. And I've never been prouder in my life. <laughs> Juan Tamayo is my upward bound brother. I have upward bound brothers and sisters all around the globe. And that is something that I am extremely proud of. In my classroom, I have my Upward Brown brothers and sisters, and I tell my students, when you graduate, you're going to be my Upward Brown brother. You're going to be my Upward Brown sister. I have gotten so much from the TRIO program, and I can't thank you enough. Thank you. sisters. <laughs> I can't play chess. Um, I didn't get the great grades that they got. I held up the caboose. That's why I became an actor. <laughs> um, you know, my Upward Bound story is just one of legacy. I, you know, when you're, when you're born into a life where you're poor, you feel invisible. You, you just feel invisible. You know, there is, you, you try to grasp at any sort of anything in your life that can sort of make you feel that you're worthy. And, when I think of Upward Bound, I think of that one kind of entity that threw me the rope that made me feel worthy. You know, they say that you don't have to barter for your worth. You don't have to hustle for your worth. You come out of your mama's womb worthy. I wish someone had told me that years ago. But Upward Bound told me that. They saw me. They saw the, you know, the nappy-headed little girl who, you know, grew up in Central Falls and uh, maybe had a few extra pounds on her and didn't know what the hell I was going to do with my life. Um, they saw me. And they saw my worth. 
They taught me how to fail. Because, you know, failure is a part of success. People say all the time, dream big, dream fierce. I always knew what I wanted to do, nothing to stand in my way and all of that. But, you know, life is hard. <laughs> um, they taught me how to fail. They taught me when I had a bad day, you could call me up and I'll sit with you and I'll talk you through it. So I remember Jeff Kenyon. He is my upward bound story. Jeff Kenyon was my counselor. He said, whenever you need help, call me. Call me. And you could call me Jeff. I said, okay, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, why am I gaining weight? Because you're eating, you just ate five Snickers bars. <laughs> really? Five Snickers bars will do it? Yeah, because of sugar. Taught me about sugar. Jeff, I'm having a really hard day in school. Can you just come? Can you just give me a few words? I'm having anxiety. Okay, I'll be there. Interrupted science, science class came in and said, I got to talk to Viola. She's going through something. And the teacher said, hold up, hold up. It's science class. He said, you better back away. <laughs> I came to talk to her until, until I talk to her, I'm not leaving. And I was like, man, they are gangsta. <laughs> and then that one day, they had a teacher brought me a brochure about a huge talent contest that was going to take place where in five different categories of music, dance, visual arts, drama, music, all of that. They got thousands of artists were going to audition and they were only gonna choose 30 artists from each category to compete in Miami to become promising artists. And a teacher gave me that brochure and said, Viola, I think you could do that. Now me, not feeling worthy, nabby every little girl, always being called nigga, 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 being from Central Falls, which a friend of mine said, that's the armpit of Rhode Island. I said, I don't think I could do it. So who do I call? Jeff Kenyon. And what does Jeff Kenyon say? Why, oh, why can't you do that? I said, now Jeff, I don't have, uh, 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 I can't do that. I, I, I mean, there's kids from all over the country are gonna be auditioning. I don't know if I have that kind of talent. He said, well, you do. I said, but I have to do a classical monologue and a contemporary monologue. He said, you know a classical monologue and contemporary monologue. I said, yeah, I do, but he said, okay, so what else? I said, Jeff, listen, I don't even have $15 for a VHS to take my audition. He said, I got $15 right here. You know, um, $15 for a VHS. I said, okay. Okay, but Jeff, I, I gotta shoot the thing. Who, listen, I can't shoot it in my living room. How am I gonna do that? He said, you know, Rhode Island Co College has a television program. They have a studio. I can get two people in there to tape you, tape your classical contemporary monologue. I said, yeah, but then I, I have to mail it. I don't have any money to mail it. <laughs> I don't have no money to mail it. He said, I got, I, I, I got money and, and you're gonna mail it. And then it was silent, and he looked at me. He said, you've run out of excuses. <laughs> I auditioned. I borrowed clothes from my sister, who was at Wood Island College at the time. We tried on 10 different outfits. And I remember when I got that notice in the mail that said I was one of 30 artists chosen out of thousands to audition as a promising artist in Miami. Yeah. Do you know what it feels like to feel like it's like the day you were born and the day you discover why you were born? This is it. I can, I can actually, I can actually do it. 
That's what an upward bound gave me. Listen, you can either leave something for people or you can leave something in people. And upward bound. What it left in me, what it left in me is it, it's, it's a gift that keeps on ticking yeah. is what it, 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 it's, it's left me. Because now, you know there's a lot of unhappy people in the world. Now there's some happy people in the world, but there's some unhappy people in the world. Some of them you want to kick them in the ass. <laughs> some of them you want to hold. Sometimes that person could be you. But what I realized, what Upward Bound gave me, is a different definition of what success is. Because you have the people who make the grades in Upward Bound. You have the intelligence. You have the drive. You have people coming from all over the world who have the most unbelievable testimony. They go on, oh, they go on to MIT and BU and Harvard. But and I feel like it's, I could say this. You go out there, and now I'm an actress, and I've hit it. You see me, right? Yeah. So I've hit it, right? Yeah. So I'm doing a TV show, I'm, doing, I'm, I'm walking the red carpet. I'm tired a lot, but I'm doing all of it. And you wonder, okay, so, boy, this is, this is, this is good, but I'm tired. I'm maybe a little disillusioned. Maybe a little this. Think about Jeff Kenyon. And what I forget is that you don't reach just for success. That's what Upward Bound told me. What you reach for is significance. <laughs> Upward Bound taught me that no matter what circumstances and obstacles are in your life, you are worth it. Yeah. You are worth yeah. every dream, every goal you have. And once you hit it, you gotta be like those relay, ra relay race uh, racers, where you got the four of the best runners and they just run their leg of the race and they pass the baton to the next runner and that runner picks up that baton and they run the next leg and that other person picks up the baton, what well, Upward Bound taught me is run your damn leg of the race. Run it. You run it. You run it for all of its, its worth. You're the best runner, but by God, have the baton and pass it on to someone. Pass it on to someone so you create a legacy of hope, a legacy where you don't have to have that little nappy-headed girl somewhere in Central Falls or Compton or Lawndale, Chicago or Garfield, Chicago or Madison, Mississippi who is once again being brought into the world feeling like she is a nobody. The power of Upward Bound is they are creating a legacy and a landscape in America where you are having a lot of people brown skin, caramel skin, poor Native Americans who are coming in and they're changing the world. So I think Upward Bound, I think Miriam Boyajan, I think Ron Stetson who taught me how to fail and who has literally who makes me feel like a good actor, too. <laughs> That's my ego, because sometimes I feel crappy. But thank you for giving me that significance, and thank you for me understanding the value of what it means to live a life. Thank you.
As many of you know, many alums of the Upper Bound and other TRIO programs, Student Support Services, Talent Search, McNair, EOC, have joined us for this conference. Some of them were sitting at a table and had a chance to get to know the Davis family two nights ago. And they were very inspired. And they accepted a baton. I've asked that Barry Cosgrove and his wife Ingrid, please stand. <laughs> now, Barry is my student. He's still my student. So the second part of this announcement has to do with the fact that I look at him and I still see him as 19. <laughs> and so since I'm the only person in the world that still sees him as 19, you have to kind of forgive him some of the second part of the announcement. But Barry came to me and he said, um, today is my mother's birthday, and I want to do something for her. So I'm making a planned gift to the Council for Opportunity in Education of a million dollars. and myself. Dr. Bishop, because he was his director at the Educational Opportunity Program at Marquette, and me because I still think of him as 19. <laughs> <laughs> if you look there with Viola, you'll see Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> Appropriately, she took the red eye from LA last night. <laughs> And she found us all worthy of sleep. <laughs> and Jen <laughs> but we know what Genesis is. Genesis is the next generation. The people whom we owe a future to. Our alumni have given us a new beginning. Genesis has told us why that is so important. Thank you and have a wonderful day.